Okay, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Hendrik Shortas. Uh, he's from Switzerland originally, where he trained in anesthesia. And he, he moved to Auckland in 2014, where he holds the <coughs> position as a pediatric anesthesia consultant at Starship Children's Hospital. Uh, he's currently working as a fellow in the PICU at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And he's going to talk to us on anesthesia and sedation and its impact on the, the developing brain. Right, thank you. So, yeah, it's anesthesia sedation, but it's, me. it's going to be mainly anesthesia for this talk. So, let's imagine you're an anesthetist and you're seeing a boy, let's call him Jack. He's two and a half years old. He's very well. The parents take good care of him. Uh, he's not vaccinated. That's because we all know that's bad for the brain. Uh, he's, got, <laughs> he's got no allergy because he's never exposed to any drugs. So, you don't really care about that, but then you realize that's the lawyers and you get a bit more nervous. So, for some unknown reason, some ENT surgeons had convinced them that he needs to have his tonsils out. So they're happy for that to be removed, but they're really nervous about the anesthesia they're about to provide. So they've got a few questions for you. And obviously, judge doesn't exist, but I've had all those questions. And it's mainly, what kind of drugs, for how long, can't you do anything else? I love the people asking me about hypnosis for tonsils. <laughs> and, uh, are you sure that in a, bit late, in a while, his brain's going to be fine because that makes us really nervous. And in the case of Jack, they've been on the internet, as I said, they love having great websites, and they found these and tell you, please don't use any of those drugs. So basically, don't use any of you, because you know, FDA have said I might be unsafe, and he's not yet three. So please don't use propofol, ketamine, midazolam, or any of your gases. <laughs> so what can I say to them uh, is what I'm going to try to do today, and run a bit through what anesthesia and children, what we've been uh, looking over the last few years. So already about 60 years ago, there was some concern about kids and anesthesia, but the idea was not drugs. The idea was more uh, Eckenhoff was sending some questionnaire was saying, oh, how do you find your kids afterwards? And there were apparently a bit more, um, some stuff like they were told to end and weren't again, and they had some change in personality. But the idea at that time was not the drugs are bad. It was we're not giving enough drugs. We should premedicate them better, and we should make them deeper for the sedation. And then... It got a bit out of, no, out of the focus until 2003, and then Jeptkovich uh, did that first study where he showed that ex early exposure to common anesthetic agents could induce widespread apoptosis. And when we talk about uh, common anesthetic agents, it's midazolam, nitrous oxide, and isoflurane. And so he had some rats, day seven uh, rats, he would anesthetize them, and then a few of them would check their brains and see widespread apoptosis. And for the others, he would let them leave and do some testing and would see, realize that they weren't as clever as the other rats. <laughs> so after that, that has started getting some concerns. And you could see how much publication has been over the last few years. It's been exponentially growing, and it's not slowing down at the moment. So what do we know about the animals? What's, what's our evidence? As I said, the main evidence is about apoptosis. Remember, apoptosis is programmed cell death. You do want apoptosis in a developing brain. What you don't want is a dysregulation of it. So uh, what you think about anesthesia is that maybe you're increasing the level of apoptosis. Uh, the diagram is just to see that if you look at the apoptosis, all of them of the cascade go to Caspar 3 activation, and the researchers are able to show Caspar 3 and to mark the cell. So, for example, this one, neonatal mice, and you see the control that have not been exposed to anesthetic versus the three brains that have been exposed to uh, desflurane, isoflurane, sevoflurane. It's quite interesting to see how those guys have to do to decide what's the MAC, um, the need for the mice. They put them in a litter box, make them breathe the gas until, and then apply painful stimuli on the tail, and when the mouse stops moving, they probably it's asleep. For that study, they didn't even go to a MAC. They went to 0.6 of a MAC during six hours, left the mice there, walked the, oh, sorry, didn't wake them up, sacrificed them, and then had a look at that. And it's not really hard to see how much greener the brains are. So all those are cells that normally shouldn't have gone into apoptosis that have gone through it. How exactly did that work? We're not sure. Um, we know it's maximal during the period of growth brain spurt. So that makes sense. When the cells are replicating, that's when the most toxic effect could happen. It's probably due to the GABA and MDA effect of our different drugs. Uh, we also think it could be neurotrophin or proteins or mitochondrial damage. So that's one of the theories behind it. In the case of uh, neurotrophin protein, you've got neural activity. And 
we think that maybe the TPA is not released or cannot cleave the plasminogen into plasmin, then that cannot cleave the BDNF into, probably DNF into BDNF, and then the cell gets the wrong signal and goes into apoptosis. And our theory is that you disrupt your mitochondrium and then the cells think it has to go into apoptosis. But that's one thing, uh, that's rodents. <laughs> uh, uh, the brain is not the same. And when you look at the, at the first uh, study I showed you just before with the, the green brains, uh, between 16 and 23% of the uh, mice that had been exposed had had a form of very generalized apoptosis because they died. So that's not exactly what happens in kids. Just exposing them is really toxic. So what can you take from the studies you've just seen that you get a bit of a doubt about that. So they've got different brain development. And then the other stuff which is quite hard is like, you cannot assess your expired CO2, you cannot take a blood pressure. When it's for IV drug injection, you cannot get an IV into a baby, my, a baby mouse, so you have to give it intraperitoneally. And as Simon mentioned, the exposure times or the, you know, the amount of drugs you give are absolutely enormous. Six hours for a mouse, already a kid, it's quite rare to have a six hour operation. But when you think of the lifespan of a mouse, <coughs> that would be what, a two weeks, two weeks uh, GA for a kid. So you've got closer model, you can use primates. It's a bit harder because, I mean, you have to grow them and you cannot, use as, uh, you cannot use as many as you would do for little animals, but it's closer to us. You can monitor the vital parameters and you can do more advanced behavioral tests. Uh, in this one, that was, I think that's the one you cited, Simon, 2011, they exposed rhesus monkey to um, ketamine. You look at the dose, 20 milligrams per kg bolus, and then an infusion of 20 to 50 milligrams per kg per hour for 24 hours. That's huge, but they do mention that's what you need to anesthetize a uh, monkey. They did recover well, and then you test them three and a half years later, and you look how well they're doing. I didn't show the graph, but they weren't doing so well in learning, they weren't behaving so well, and apparently the Previously drugged monkeys were less motivated in their tasks. <laughs> As time goes by, they get more and more precise. This one is from this year, and it's quite nice to see. I suppose that's because the anesthesia community got more in touch with the researchers to try to get something that's more clinically relevant. So this one is for Sivoran, and it's three times four hours exposure. It is long, but instead of making a huge exposure, they did three different GAs that we do see in clinics. And they really look at them all the parameters that the animal are intubated, they are monitored like you would do for a normal kid. And then you can do more precise testing. And in that particular case, well, they didn't find much difference afterwards except in the self-directed, and apparently that's a sign of anxiety in a monkey. So you can be a bit more precise, but again, you're not completely sure what you're seeing. Um, Simon again already showed part of that slide, so above the line is the study that says, yes, there's something wrong, and below the line, studies that say there's nothing wrong. In red, you've got studies preclinical, like apoptosis and stuff, and blue, you've got the behavior. So the first one tells you how long they've been exposed, and the majority of studies have been following the model of six hours of exposure, but shorter models also show that. And on the other part, it's the age equivalent. So the animal age, what does it represent if that was a baby, accounting the brain growth spurt? And most of the studies for like premature, like 30 weaker, but still there is quite a lot of evidence and it looks a bit worrying the idea that you can give anesthesia and induce those kinds of changes. So in all that, any drugs that you could trust that would not induce apoptosis, well there's two that seem to be okay. One is then on the noble gas, which I have never ever used. And the MAC is 70% and it's usually expensive. So I don't think we're gonna use it a lot. And I'm not going to talk about this one. Dexmethadomidine, everyone talks about it all the time. Uh, it does make sense to think that some, uh, some drug that does not act through the GABA or an N NMDA will have less apoptosis. It's true that there's some studies that have shown a bit, but most studies don't show the apoptosis-induced case with dexmethadomidine. And even better, it seems that if you put some dexmethadomidine with our anesthetic gas, then you've got neuroprotection. So that'd be great. Maybe we found our hero, the one we should use all the time to protect our kids from our nasty drugs. But we still have an answer. Do we have a problem for kids? That's the main question. And so far with the animal, we don't really know. So you have to do study for kids, but it's quite hard. You can't really make a study. The one we would like to do is to take normal kid to anesthetize him for a couple of hours and send him home and evaluate a few years later. But I don't think any ethics committee would be happy with that. Um, Ideally, you want a prospective study, but 
obviously you've got retrospective evidence which is easier to, ac to access. And then is the question, what are you going to assess? Are you going to look at school performance? So people have tried that. Are you going to look at the clinical diagnosis, is it ADHD, autism, all kind of clinical diagnosis you could see? And again, that has been tried quite a lot. Or are you going to do neuropsychological tests? So we're not going to run through all the studies. We're just going to go through, through three of them. And this one is uh, from this year. It's from pretty close. It's New South Wales people that have, apparently you can link all the birth records to get anesthesia. And what they've done, they've looked at all the children born, the children that had had anesthesia, and then they linked that to some tests you do. One is to get ready to get to school, and another one is your school performance for you when you're in year three. Uh, they excluded cases of all the children that were sick for other reasons, and they tried to compare to kids that were exposed to general anesthetic to kids that were not exposed to it. And it seems that the more anesthesia you get, the poor outcome you've got at school at least. And if you're only exposed once, the results are way better, but you still got poor numeracy uh, as a result of it. Now, all those studies, all the retrospective studies, saying that, yes, you might have something, but you can never exclude all the other confounders you've got. Uh, for example, we see a lot of kids that come for uh, grommet insertion, but those kids usually come for grommet insertion because they've got liquids within there tympan, so they don't hear as well. So it's not surprising that in school they might not do as well. Two, for the den uh, dental surgery, which another one where you're happy you've got healthy kids. But we all know that there's way more people with lower income that come to those kind of surgery. And we know how bad that is when you're scored, how terribly linked it is that if you're a food from a poor family, it's going to be harder for you in school. So now, is it anesthesia or is it just the fact that you're pointing out all the issues and that's really hard to find out? The study that has tried to assess that a bit uh, more thoroughly is the PAN, one of them is PANDA study. So it's an ambidirectional sibling match cohort. What they did, they look at the record for ASA 1 and 2 that would go for inguinal hernia repair before the age of 3, well, which makes that it's 90% male. And then they contacted those family, enrolled them, and tried to find if they had a sibling that had not been exposed to anesthesia in the same lifespan. The idea being you get the genetics sorted this way, and it's more or less the, the same income background. And for one exposure at least, they couldn't find any difference in IQ, memory, learning language. They did all kind of tests, and for them, they, no difference at all. So that's quite reassuring for us. At least one anesthesia doesn't seem to be linked to bad outcome. And some also, you mentioned the gas study. So that's the only prospective study we've got to date. Uh, it's, again, anesthesia for inguinal hernia repair. You include the children that were born greater than 26 weeks, and you had to make sure they weren't exposed beforehand to anesthesia, either when they were little or in the third trimester of pregnancy. They were randomized to have either general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia. You, if you were in the general anesthesia group, you had to have Sivoran, no other drugs, and you were not allowed to put opiates. You would put some local anesthesia for those kids for afterwards. And then the physiological parameter, everything, the pressure, glycemia, saturation, they were carefully kept within pretty fine range. Well, I hope you don't need the gas study for that, but still. Primary outcome is not out yet. It, uh, that test they will do when they're five years old, so it must have been done. I suppose it's going to be published because that was 2018. The second outcome was uh, at two years of age, the Bailey scales for infant and toddler, and they couldn't find any difference. So again, quite reassuring that one exposure to anesthesia does not seem to be causing any neurobehavioral problems. So what can I say to that anxious family? What can we say? Well, we, you cannot give certainty. It's one anesthesia, um, and it's, it, really, it seems to be very safe, but be 100% sure is impossible, and it will still take a little while before we can do that. Future directions, so all the um, experts in the field have had a big meeting last year, and that's their recommendation. Reading them to me seems, let's do the same, but more. You need more preclinical data, so you need more animal data to try to understand a bit better what's the mechanism that induce that neurotoxicity. You want to do cohort study, bigger, and the, more, the bigger number you have, maybe you'll be able to pinpoint a bit more adequately what's wrong. And what you want also to do is to do more prospective study to see if there's anything else you can see uh, in more detail. 
So in the meantime, what can we do as an aesthetist? I don't think there's any evidence for us to change our practice, at least not now. Can we do more regional anesthesia? Yeah, sure, maybe not for tonsils, but sure that we used, <laughs> we used to say for spinal that less than 30 minutes or more than 30, 45 minutes, we shouldn't, and clearly we can. And dexmetodomidine, that's the one we all ask for. If really we think it's neuroprotective, shall we use it? Well, maybe we can, but the question remains, is it useful? And there is now the T-Rex study, which has started, which will be a multi-centered study, where they're going to comp do exactly that. They're going to use Severan low dose associated with remifentanil and dexmetodomidine, compare it to normal SIBO. Uh, it'd be procedures are way longer, so that makes sense, as we just said. Uh, the longer, the more neurotoxicity. Um, they hope to complete that within a few years, and we might have an answer, and maybe we'll use it even more by then. And now, just the thing to remember, and that's more for us, because we've got healthy kids when we're in anesthetic, is that it's just not the drugs we give, the effects they have, and we all, we all do that. We take the kid, he's calm, he's screaming, we just put the mask on him, and then we let him sleep, and we put the line in, but then we can't get the line, and so we try another time and another time, and we finally got that line 35 minutes into the case, and we still haven't taken a blood pressure. So that's something we can change, that's something we have probably to be a bit more careful about, to really get that. Uh, McCann had published that in 2014. It's only a case report, it's six cases. But basically, neonates, they were fine. They go through GA, which were not that long. Everything was fine, and they've got massive encephalopathy afterwards. The only thing she could pinpoint was that it might have been hypotension. One of them had mean blood pressure lower than 40 to 45. All the other were fine. It was actually the systolic blood pressure was seen to be below 80, so I was quite worrying. And she's part of the GAS study, and they published uh, a sub, a sub analysis on it. And not surprisingly, a GA uh, gets more hypotension than the, than the regional. So that may be something else we could work about. And yeah, just try when you do your practice, give the same drugs, but all around, that's something we can work about. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, do we have any questions for Cedric? Thanks for a great talk. Can you tell me the evidence you've presented here? How are you going to translate that to what you do in the ICU for the drugs that you pick? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. In ICU, that's why I concentrate on anesthesia, because in the ICU it's even harder. We've got those confounder in anesthesia where we wonder did the pathology, so imagine intensive care. By definition, they're all sick. Um, what, what I do, it's just, it's just a bit more of the same. I try to avoid midazolam or ketamine if I can. It's quite rare. I love dexmetolomidine like everyone else. Um, and then maybe not the, the kid that's going to, you know, who's cardiac and very acutely unwell. We're all very careful, but maybe the bronch when we're about to chew because it's respiratory. And we, I think we do that too in intensive care. We, we concentrate on the airway because that's the problem. And we don't really look at the blood pressure. Yes, we cycle every two minutes, but if it goes a bit down because you've given a bit more sedation, that I can't see much action. I try now to a bit more, to be more conscious of that and maybe intervene a bit earlier, a bit metaramine or something to maintain those blood pressure. Any other questions? If not, we'll move along. Thanks, uh, Cedric.